Welcome, Dr. Tatum. It is such an honor to, to be up here with you today. Thank you for joining us. Well, thanks so much for having me. I'm excited about our conversation. Great. I thought we would start just by diving right into the title of your book. Um, as any teacher who might be with us here tonight knows, you could have also called this book, Why Are All the Asian Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria? Why Are All the White Kids Sitting Together? You could have called this book, Why Are Our Cafeterias So Segregated? Why, how did you arrive at the title? That's a great question, and it really goes back to the 90s, right? So the first version of this book was published in 1997, and I wrote it after having been teaching a course on the psychology of racism uh, for many years, and as a consequence of that work, I started doing workshops for teachers and principals in school districts around the country. And whenever I would walk into a racially mixed school, someone would ask me, why are all the black kids sitting together in the cafeteria? And I wanted to respond to that question, though of course, as you said, it could have been framed in a different way, but it never was. It always came to me in that way. And so when I wrote the book in 97, I called it, why are all the black kids sitting together in the cafeteria and other conversations about race? It was, and I like to always emphasize the second half of the title and other conversations about race, because while of course the, the question, the, the question that appears in the title is addressed in the book, really the book is less about that particular question and more about understanding racism in the United States, how it operates, as I like to say, what, so what, and now what. What is racism? How does it operate in our current context? So what does that mean in terms of how we think about ourselves and other people? The identity development piece is right up in that so what section. And then now what? Now what can we do about it? How do we interrupt that cycle? And in fact, uh, towards the end of the book, you actually have whole sections about the experiences of our native students, our students, our Asian students, our mixed race students. Um, was that sort of at the forefront that you always knew those sections were going to be in the book? Well, when I started, the short answer is yes, and I'll tell you why. When I was teaching, you know, I started teaching about racism when I was 26 years old. The first time I taught a course on the psychology of racism was at UC Santa Barbara. As was mentioned, I started teaching there. And when I first started the work, I was, you know, when I first started that teaching, it was very much around a black-white paradigm. But I had Latino students in my class, I had Asian students in my class, and they would say, you know, where, where am I in this narrative? And that encouraged me over time to expand how I thought about that course and, uh, and recognizing as I learned more about the experiences of institutionalized racism um, across different groups, historically past and present, it was clear to me that I should write my book in the most inclusive way. So when I wrote it in 1997, I was thinking about my students and wanting to be sure that they would see themselves in the book. Fast forward 20 years, one of the things that's really different about this version of my book is that those sections have been expanded. And that really um, in part reflects the changing demographics of our society and for example, in the first version of the book, there was maybe a paragraph about um, students from the Middle East, um, Muslim students. Now, anybody can be a Muslim, right? It's not geographically located, but we often associate Middle Eastern identity with being Muslim. And particularly in today's context, in 2017, it seemed important to include Middle Easterners, North Africans, in the book, and so there's a much expanded section um, as one example. How much of, um, a lot has changed in the last 20 years, but when you bring up especially the experiences of our Muslim students, mm -hmm. a lot has changed in that conversation just in the last year, mm -hmm. considering with our last presidential election, how much as you were getting ready to publish this anniversary edition, how much has been changed over the last 20 years, and how much has been changed in as you edited this book just in the last 12 months? Well, as I was working on the book, I was working on it right up and so I was working on it during the season of our election, 2016, and I, can, I turned it into my publisher in March 2017. 
So anything that happened up until March <laughs> is in there, um, but certainly some things that have happened since then are not. So for example, Charlottesville is not in the book because it was already in press when those events happened. But particularly for the section where I was writing about the experiences of uh, Muslim students in an increasingly Islamophobic society, um, certainly 9-11-2001 is a, a marker for a lot of people, you know, in terms of how um, their life experience shifted following that particular set of events. Um, and in fact, you have a whole chapter at the beginning of the book that is, I feel like we should acknowledge the elephant in the room or the elephant on Twitter, which is you have a whole section entitled the Trump, what is it called? The uh, Living in the Age of Trump. Yes. Was, that, was that a chapter that you were eager to write or that you <laughs> dreaded writing? Well, you know, it's you, right at the beginning of the book. What was that like yeah. for you? Well, let me just start out by saying the book does start with a prologue, mm -hmm. right? Um, and when I, you know, as was mentioned, I served as president of Spelman College from 2002 to 2015, 13 years. And when I got ready to stop doing that, when I announced I was going to retire, many people asked me, well, what are you going to do next? So this is 2015. And I said, well, my first project is I want to update my book, the one we're talking about, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria and Other Conversations About Race. And I, um, and so when I s told my friends and other people that this is what I was planning to do, and while I was doing it, people would ask me, do they still sit together? <laughs> and, uh, you know, 20 years later, are they still sitting together? And we know the answer to that question is yes. But then the question I would be asked was, is it better? And so isn't anything better? And that question is a more complex question. And it was really that question that I wanted to reflect on in the prologue of the book. You know, what, what is different? What has happened in the last 20 years relative to race relations? And as I'm working on that, right, so I started working on the book in, really working on it in earnest in 2016, I'm working on it, and this election is happening. And so, of course, those daily news items, <laughs> those daily news You're writing items, prompts, really. Really? Yes. No. I, I have to say, you know, thank goodness for the New York Times and the Washington Post. I mean, I was constantly getting new information uh, to incorporate and to situate relative to, you know, not just the election, though, of course, that had, you know, that was giving us plenty of information. But even if you go back, well, to just say a little bit more, I mean, there's sort of several patterns that have shifted over the last 20 years. One of them is demographics, right? We know our population has changed. And so I was born in 1954. I know I'm not the only 50s baby in the room, I suspect. Um, at that time, the U.S. population was 90% white. Wow, yeah, 90% white. 90% <laughs> white. In 2014, 60 years later, the school-age population was majority kids of color, more than 50% children of color for the first time. And so that's a dramatic shift, right, in our population. But some things didn't change. Demographics changed, but school segregation did not, right? Same, new faces, same places. But if we think about, uh, and in fact, today, public schools are more segregated than they were 20 years ago. Neighborhoods continue to be segregated. In the last 20 years, we've seen a backlash against affirmative action, and that has had certainly implications for higher education in significant ways, particularly state institutions in those states where affirmative action has been outlawed, places like California, Michigan, et cetera. Um, we also see in the last 20 years the dramatic rise. Um, Dr. Abe was talking about discipline, disparate, disciplinary practices. You know, we hear today references about the school to prison pipeline. We know that mass incarceration as a phenomenon really took off in the 90s. Um, so there's been that 20-year history 
of that. In the last 20 years, we also know about the impact of the collapse of the economy, the 2008 financial crisis, and the exacerbation of income inequality, particularly in, um, as it relates to communities of color, black and Latinx in particular. As an example, Native Americans certainly, and we think about the, all the police shootings, right, of the more recent, you know, the last, uh, you know, if we start with Trayvon Martin, which was not a police shooting, but 2012, followed by the various cases we are all familiar with in the, you know, 2013, 2014, 2015, and all of that, you know, I'm trying to make sense of all of that, and I'm working on that, writing about those things, and then we have this election. And so that, of course, was very significant in terms of the ways in which the rhetoric um, coming from candidate Trump really was enlivening um, and emboldening the activity of neo-Nazi groups and white supremacist groups. And certainly, post-election, we saw a, a continued rise. I want to say dramatic rise, and maybe it was dramatic, but really, since 2008, the election of President Obama, another significant thing, of course, in the last 20 years, um, since his election, in response to his election, there has been a continuing rise in hate crime uh, activity and hate group activity, particularly internet activity. 